Hello, John. Hey, George, how are you? Good, how are you? Pretty good, enjoying my summer vacation. Oh, well, how is it out there? You know, we're really surrounded by horrendous forest fires, and, and it's a little, just slightly smoky this morning, but uh, yeah, it's been I, horrible. I was reading some of your posts about it. It's just normal summer here. It's it's uh, mm. hot and muggy, but, uh, you know, we're not facing the apocalypse like you apparently are out there. Oh. Oh, it's just horrible, and so the most beautiful country up in the Pecos wilderness, it's just its just burning. This one fire, the Horoso Fire, named after Horoso Creek, um, where it started, is, is just, you know, it's completely, it, it was zero contained, zero percent contained when I checked last night, and mm -hmm. I, I don't know about this morning, but I doubt that there's been significant progress. It's just really horrible. It's, it's um, you know... You have that obviously much more often than we have it out here, but about 15 years ago, I don't know if you remember, there were um, we had a terrible drought one summer. I mean, it really started late winter. It just there was just no rain, and yeah. by um, July or so, it was really scary, tinder dry. It was so dry that I remember in the woods um, around our house, you'd take a walk. And you couldn't hear any bugs or birds or anything. It was as though uh, all of nature had gone into hibernation because of the terrible uh, drought. Mm. And then um, there were fires that apparently it was it was so dry that there were some fires that started when lightning hit a um, hit a tree, and then that fire would be spotted and put out. But then um, the fire would spread underground. So it would smolder mm. in the, the roots and uh, the, the dry, oh, compacted leaves underground, and then it would spurt up <sighs> through another tree wow. hundreds of yards away from the first one. Oh, and man. Um, across the river, you know, in uh, Cold Spring now, right across the river is West Point, and mm. apparently a fire started near one of the ranges out there um, where there mm. were... Uh, they were, you know, I don't know, testing mortars and shit like that. And uh, yeah. it became really bad. It was so bad that um, the hills were completely on fire across from us. And they were bringing up helicopters and scooping up water and dumping the water on the fires and trying to put it out that way. And it was. Oh, yeah, that's what they do here. Yeah, it was pretty apocalyptic, except here it's right in this populated area. Yeah, yeah, this is all, uh, so far it's in the wilderness, although it's getting getting closer and closer to some some settled areas, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. I mean, we've had three summers like that consecutively. I mean, winters, summers, and uh, that was following many years of uh, somewhat milder drought, so it's just incredibly volatile. Yeah, yeah well... So. Well, good luck dealing with that. Listen, I, I want to get as quickly as possible to your the fantastic article that you wrote for Discover mm. Magazine, which I just read this morning, actually. Um, oh, thanks. And uh, which apparently is is adapted from your book that's just about to come out, uh, the Cancer Club. Yeah, or, right. Or is your book actually what What's the actual publication date? The exact publication date is August 28th, I think. August 28th. It's always funny how precise they are about these things. But, um, yeah, and this is actually, it's an excerpt from Chapter 3. It's kind of uh, the beginning and, I don't know, maybe two-thirds of Chapter 3, but uh, not exactly. You, know, you always have to adapt these things so they stand stand independently for the magazine, mm -hmm. Ray Magazine, but it's called Cancer the Long Shadow, and uh, it so happens that I have a copy of it here. I don't think you can read it online yet unless you uh, subscribe to Discover, so it's in the July-August issue. Oh, really? I just... Oh, that's right. You sent me a PDF. Yeah, I sent you the PDF because I didn't know... I, I think you could only uh, get it online if you, if you subscribe to the magazine and then use a password, mm -hmm. but... Uh, That'll change after the. I, I think they run like a month out of sync with what you can get online and what's on the on the newsstand. But anyway, so yeah, that was nice. I'm hoping it's a way to you know get some people interested in the book beforehand. Oh, I thought this was great, George. This is uh, 
I mean, uh, you know, not to flatter you, buddy, but uh, you're such a fucking good writer. And, um, oh, uh, you know, there's so many things that I, I loved in this. I, I really loved you going into the, uh, the British Museum and the guy leaves you with this famous fossil. I can't believe that. I, I'm, I'm assuming <laughs> that there was some grotesque oversight and this curator was later fired for, no, uh, no, 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 for letting no. you actually hold this rare piece of an ancient uh, pre-human in your um, in your head. Oh no, he, he he was one he was one of the top guys, and he could just take one look at me and see that I was trustworthy. Okay. But, uh, just, just to provide some context, this was the Canum jaw or the Canum mandible, and it's a piece of jaw, you know, now petrified. Uh, that was found by uh, Louis Leakey, mm -hmm. Richard Leakey's uh, father in the early 1930s in northwest Kenya, and it's widely believed to be the first or one of the earliest examples of uh, cancer in the, uh, in the hominid record. It's uh, pre-human, and uh, scientists argue over whether it's um, Neanderthal or Homo habilis, and some of them think that it might be later Pleistocene and might be only you know, a matter of thousands or tens of thousands of years old, and then some like Leakey dated it back to uh, early Pleistocene, which would be one or two million years old. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, you know, in, in every cancer timeline, or not everyone, but cancer timelines all over the web refer to the Canon mandible as being the first example of, of, of cancer and a close cousin to man, and, and therefore in man. And... Um, so I just by reading, you know, I, you just, that's all it is. It's just these little snippets here and there. So I spent a fair amount of time tracking down all the research on it and reading all of that, and finally persuaded the British Museum to let me come in and see the thing. Uh -huh. Yeah, I would assume <laughs> I would have assumed that these would all be sealed off in in vacuum uh, containers and and uh, mm -hmm. you know with no exposure to light or anything like that, but. Oh, well, it is a rock, you know. And, and so, George, apparently you, you almost uh, <laughs> dropped the thing on the floor and shattered it into a million pieces? Well, I was worried at one point when I, when I suddenly realized, you know, I was just so, you know, concentrating on this and taking notes. And, um, and, and there were some other, you know, interesting old records about this that, were, that came in the box with the, with the cannon jaw. So, you know, at one point when I looked down and I realized that, it had like moved on this, this pad that they put it on, and it moved very close to where the table was kind of sloping downward. And I thought, God, that would be embarrassing, <laughs> to say the least. Right. So much for being so trustworthy. <laughs> yeah. So you know, there was another. There, there was an article recently about another a um, a bone tumor found in a in a Neanderthal. Mm -hmm. uh, remains, which is interesting. So there's another one now since I wrote the article. Well, so you said that the, the total number of um, sort of shards of evidence um, from the uh, from our ancestry of uh, of cancer are mm -hmm. is it what was it in the hundreds or? Yeah, um, I had, I have not to this day seen anyone who has put together. A number of every one that's reported in the literature, so I did it myself, and and I came close. There was one. There, there's a uh, a uh, Czech anthropologist, a uh, physical anthropologist named uh, Eugen Strohal, and he had done a paper in which he he had counted everything he he could find in the old world, and but he hadn't done new world, and you know, and by that time I had accumulated, I think, you know, every reference to every one. It's been documented, and I came up with a total of just right around 200. And so 200 examples of what appear to be cancer in the human fossil record. And in, in the big question that raises, is that a little or is that a lot? So, and the really the dominant view among paleopathologists, they actually have such a thing, and, and a subset called paleo-oncologists, the dominant view is the 200 is just the tiniest little tip of the iceberg when you consider how extremely unlikely it is that these things would be found even among all of the human remains that we stumbled upon in a couple of centuries of, uh, 
anthropology mm -hmm. and our archaeology, and um, that you know you'd have to multiply the 200 you know millions of times to get the to get the um, right number. And that I find that persuasive. I mean, for one thing, you're only going to find bone cancer, right? Mm -hmm. Except rare exceptions with mummies, um, and you're and only. You know, bone cancers, primary bone cancers that start in the skeleton are extremely rare, and most bone cancers are metastatic. Right. And still, you know, this is very rare, you know, compared with, you know, your general population. So, so you're only going to see um, bone cancers that either started in the skeleton or spread there from another organ. And then, you know, metastatic cancers can spread to various places, and only a certain percentage of them will reach the bone before, you know, the patient dies from something else, you know, the cancer in another organ. So there's a very small, it represents a very small subset of the amount of cancer, and then you have to figure how likely it is that you'll find the specimens with bone cancer. You know, the bone cancer itself may have caused the bone to crumble and be destroyed. So you can put together a pretty good argument that, Cancer was, you know, quite prevalent in the in the in the distant past, and yet, you know, there are, as you would expect, a uh, there's a counter argument. I think it's the minority view that uh, 200 is 200. You know, that they're really you have to look awfully hard, and that cancer has been, you know, maybe it's always been there, but it's been hugely amplified by modern civilization. But, can I can I ask you something? You, you, you know, some of these people, even this uh, this uh, I guess it's almost about a million years old, this mandible that you looked at. And well, it is. Uh, that's how Leakey and, and a lot of anthropologists uh, believe it's early Pleistocene. And uh, since Leakey found it, our definition of Pleistocene has changed. But yeah, a million. And you show a picture you know, of it. More, 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 more or less. Um, and you, yeah, and, and, but I wanted to say that there's, a, you know, again, there's, you know, there's a counter argument and. Um, Anthropologists who think that this was a newer fossil that had accidentally um, contaminated the, um, the stratum in which Leakey was looking. So, uh -huh. you know, there's a certain amount of controversy, and I dealt with that uh, in the article and especially in the book. I get into it you know, in a lot more detail. Well, here, here's the question I had. It, so, some of these, for these, for for the cancer to get that to get far enough so that you can find fossil evidence of it hundreds of thousands, even a million years later, it's, it's quite advanced. And some of these people, I assume, were really suffering, may have been debilitated in some way. I think yeah. you allude to this in your article. Is, are, can you mm. also see some of these as evidence of that, uh, that these people were being taken care of by others in their group? Ah, yeah, that's a, that's a great point, and, and that's actually a point that uh, Eugen Strohal makes in, in at least one of his papers where there's this woman who's, you know, from the skull, you can see that her, her face was just basically, you know, a huge portion eaten away by a cancer that he uh, diagnosed as a nasopharyngeal carcinoma, mm -hmm. which is a carcinoma that that it's not that it metastasizes to the bone per se, but it's right up against the bone and um, and causes it to degrade. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and he, he he has this you know very poignant quote in his paper that this woman would not have been able to get to this point in life if she hadn't been cared for by uh, her uh, fellow creatures. So yeah, I remember reading an article. Scientific American had an article. It must have been I don't know twenty twenty five years ago about the discovery of a dwarf, of a Neanderthal dwarf skeleton and mm -hmm. that was a mature male and uh, so, and obviously this person could not have cared for himself, um, could not have hunted, gathered food on his own and so yeah. this was seen as evidence of, of uh, cooperation, compassion, caring on the part of these uh, very early people well before civilization. It's very heartening. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, George, I mean, there's a lot we could talk about in here. You've got a really, um, a very provocative, profound conclusion to this that ties in with some things that you've been writing on your blog lately 
about uh, the whole issue of environmental contaminants, whether modern pollution is is causing an upswing in cancer rates. And um, so I, if, I, I'm just going to read this, if I may. The last yeah, paragraph. Yeah, if you would. Okay. Uh, the world has grown more complex. Longevity has soared along with the manufacture of cigarettes. Diets have changed drastically, and the world is awash with synthetic substances. The medical system has gotten better at detecting cancer. Epidemiologists are still trying to untangle all the threads. Yet running beneath the surface, there was a core rate of cancer, the legacy of being multicellular creatures in an imperfect world. There is mm. no compelling evidence that this baseline is much different now than it was in ancient times. Right. That's, I mean, a lot of people are going to be, I, I would assume, aghast at that statement or certainly will uh, challenge it. It's, it's related to some of these, these uh, scientific cases and court cases in which there are cancer clusters um, that are yeah. blamed on, on various sources of industrial pollution. We've talked about this in the past in, in, the, mm. in the, uh, the case of uh, uh, the Ek uh, Aaron Brockovich um, right, film right. and uh, you know that whole case of uh, of saying that cancer was caused by by um, by these industrial pollutants. Um, right. And so this is the conclusion that that you come to after your immersion in this whole topic that that maybe modern civilization is not significantly changing the baseline rate of cancer. The baseline rate. I mean, I mean, obviously we we live much longer. Right. Than people did back then, and the uh, the median age of uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, most cancers are diagnosed. Uh, what is it? Seventy some percent are diagnosed by age 55. The, the numbers in my my article, but most cancers by far are diagnosed in people who have gotten you know well past middle age and are becoming old, and obviously many exceptions, but you know percentage. Um, so we, we live longer, so we have more chance to get cancer because something else doesn't kill us first. Uh, cigarettes are the one artificial component that there's no controversy that they have amplified the number of ca cancer cases. So you have to allow for those. On the other hand, things like stomach cancer are becoming increasingly rarer, mm -hmm. especially in the developed world, with the exception of some Asian countries that uh, were may have something to do with uh, diets, including salty fish. But, um, yeah, you, you allow for all of these things, and underneath there, humming along, is just a certain amount of cancer that's always going to happen from spontaneous muta mutations and the fact that we're these complex multicellular creatures living in a world of entropy. And, and what every, every second, four million cells in your body are dividing. That was a number that uh, Robert Weinberg, the great uh, researcher at the Whitehead Institute at MIT, came up with. Every second. Um, every second, four million cells are dividing. You know, it's not the same cell that's dividing again and again, but every every second and the next second, a different subset of four million right. cells are dividing. So your cells are constantly dividing and replenishing themselves. And each time they do this, they copy their DNA. You know, the whole genetic library of Alexandria. And... Um, there's always mistakes. Right. You know, some of the mistakes are corrected with, you know, all these amazing mechanisms, DNA proofreading that have evolved. Um, many mutations don't matter one way or the other. Um, you know, they're just, they're just completely neutral and then, then are carried along with no effect on the, the phenotype or the function of the cell. Uh, and then there's uh, mutations that just kill the cell outright. Right. And then there's the ones that are corrected, but you still get, you know, all these mutations that are going to be squeaking through. And it's a good thing you do because if you had, if you had a perfect mechanism for avoiding mutations, we never would have evolved. Did, uh, so, <laughs> so let me. So if I could just sure. continue that one thought. So that's kind of a, it's kind of an interesting tension about about life has to be free to evolve, and in the way life evolved on Earth, this means uh, through random mutation and natural selection. And you have to loosen up enough on the cells so that they can 
undergo these mutations. So, but if you loosen up too much, you get cancer. So there's this balance yeah. that has been struck by nature, and uh, it's going to allow for a certain amount of cancer is just an unfortunate natural outcome. Now it could be though I, um, that I mean I I I I remember. Daniel Dennett once talking about the evolution of evolution, that how there are certain evolutionary processes that themselves evolve. And I'm wondering if, if anybody has made a case, let's say, for an overall, I mean, could it be that you'd even have an overall reduction in rates of cancer um, as our genome, because natural selection is acting on our genome and maybe um, constantly trying to improve uh, replication and eliminate some of these errors that can lead to various problems including cancer. So you, so you could imagine that, that we would steadily become better, our, our systems would become better at detecting and weeding out the errors before they resulted in a deadly cancer. Yeah, something like that. I, I guess the counter argument, I mean something like that could certainly be going on to some extent and yet you, get, you end up with the problem that most cancer strikes people that are beyond the age of reproduction. Right. Yeah. So it's you know so evolution doesn't care if you live, you know, past a certain point and can no longer reproduce and pass along your genes. Right. It's funny that you know because there are evolutionary biologists who still worry about the role of menopause, for example, and is can there be mm -hmm. some a, uh, adaptive purpose to uh, menopause, even though by definition mm. it's it's something that happens after women women have uh, ceased to reproduce. Right. Um, Jordan, so just let me make sure I understand this correctly about this kind of base rate of cancer. If, yeah. if you correct for the aging of the population, for, for the, the, uh, the enormous increase in longevity that we've had, especially over the last, I don't know, 100, 150, 100 years. 150 years. 100, 150, yeah. yeah. Um, that that corrected for that, that the cancer rate arguably has remained pretty flat. Yeah, pretty flat. I mean, and then again with anomalies like cigarettes, right. and, uh, or, um, or, or 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 the cancers that are amplified by overcrowding, like uh, cervical cancer because of uh, because of the uh, spread of uh, HPV virus, and and, uh, and 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 a lot of that's based. I mean, you can really, you know, again, it's. A lot, it just makes sense evolutionarily in what we know about multi-celled creatures. So that's one argument for that. And the other is, um, I mean, all as far as you can really go back and get decent uh, census records and, and medical records and uh, you know death certificates is you know really the late part of the 1900s mm -hmm. in, in uh, England, England and Wales. It happens, which which jointly corrected records and. Um, those are the last that are really considered reliable. So you can go back there and you can compare cancer rates to cancer rates now and then allow for things like more lung cancer now because of uh, cigarettes, which are you know, much more effective at directing carcinogens into your lungs than, say, pipes or cigars or any other form of taking tobacco. And you correct for the fact that there was more stomach cancer back then. Um, you know, you can find evidence that you know it's, that things are pretty much the same then as there are now. And then there, there have been these studies that I described toward the end of the article in my book, where they've taken this formula that uh, an anthropologist in the UK, Tony Waldron, came up with, where he figured uh, uh, the likelihood or the prevalence of different kinds of cancer now and then. And then, say in the uh, early, the, the late 1900s, so we adjusted for that. So the prevalence of cancer before cigarettes, basically, and the and the stomach cancer spike, um, and then from the next step was to see what percentage of these cancers metastasized with what frequency to the skeleton. And he was basically able to come up with a rough estimate of if you just took a sampling, a random sampling of skeletons from the uh, late 1900s, uh, how much cancer you would expect to find. Yeah. And, and then this was applied by a, a team from Munich to uh, some, uh, some burials in uh, some medieval burials and also some in ancient Egypt. And they came up with basically 
the same number. So, you know, it's not enough evidence that it's probably going to sway someone who, you know, really already, you know, deeply believes that cancer has been greatly amplified by modern civilization. But it's a strong argument. You know, to, just as, as we're speaking, I'm thinking 19th century England, and, and yeah. I mean, in all the major towns, you had horrific yeah. pollution right. from coal. Right. No, that's true. That's true. I mean, uh, air pollution was, was very, very and bad. And even so. if you go further back, I mean, I, I've actually lived, I've, I've spent times in my life where I've, uh, I've, I've lived outdoors or in a tent, and I'm basically doing yeah. all my cooking and staying warm oh, in yeah. a fire. And so you're, right. you're constantly Im immersed in, um, in smoke, and even ordinary wood smoke, I assume, has uh, plenty of things that are are toxic, and uh, yeah, I mean you know yeah, and could possibly cause mutations in small amounts, and that's all eliminated. Sure. And you know, in some ways, we're living in a much much less polluted environment right now. That's true. Than than that's most true. of our ancestors were. Well, that's true, and then you know and that applies to the cave people as well. You know, you know yeah. <laughs> living with smoke, smoke in their caves, and there's natural carcinogens, you know, abundant all over the earth, including sunlight. And uh, um, no, I mean, there's just all of these factors that you have to have to consider, and What's... and and you know, and there's no question that you know the chemicals that have been produced in the last hundred years through through industrialization. These include some some um, you know very nasty carcinogens and they've certainly been shown to um, in, you know increase cancer and cause clusters among workers that are exposed to these day after day after day mm -hmm. but there's very little little evidence that um, th that the same factor these same carcinogens in the dilute form that people receive them in the public even people living you know near these sites it's still so dilute that uh, it's very, very difficult. It's been very, very difficult for epidemiologists to make a case that these contribute to more than a few percent of all the cancers. I, I would assume, I, and I hope, that you get a lot of media attention from this for this because I think it's really important. I want to bring up another issue that I've been... Yeah, I, I, I just... Uh, it, it, before we change the subject, I wanted to say one, one other mm -hmm. thing. Okay, which is... Um, you know, basically, that one of the frustrating things about writing about this is it sounds like you're like an apologist for Monsanto or for Dow Chemical sure. or something, or that you think pollution is just fine, or you get these smart alecky comments on my blog, like, "Oh well, I'm sure since you're so convinced that there was um, no cancer cluster in the Aaron Brockovich case, that you uh, drink the water there for the next 20 years and let's see what happens." And, you know, just dumb, stupid stuff like this. I mean, I think pollution is horrible, and obviously every attempt should be made to reduce these things to the smallest numbers possible. And there are certainly arguments that that uh, that carcinogens could be contributing in very subtle ways to the many, many other factors that have to come together before someone gets cancer, because cancer is a multifactorial thing. And, um, you know, you can make an argument that... Uh, it's causing more cancer than we realize. We just don't understand the mechanisms, and, and that you should be, I mean, you, you should be as careful as possible. But on the other hand, if you follow the so called precautionary principle to its limits, you wouldn't be able to do anything. You know, civilization would basically, basically stop. So, um, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention was I pulled up the reference to that Neanderthal find and, and, uh, so it's a 120,000-year-old rib of a Neanderthal from a cave ex excavation in uh, Central Europe and University of Pennsylvania. That's very interesting. It was a benign bone tumor rather than a malignant one. Uh -huh. but, uh, yeah, still you know, more evidence in that regard. So let's do a transition. Well, actually, I, I want to keep talking about cancer, So, but, oh. but switch to something. Because <laughs> I, I, I think we've talked to, about this before, but not with this great context about cancer as being this kind of um, constant, uh, uh, if you will, in, um, in uh, the human condition. So mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just downloaded a, an article, a very short article from uh, Big Think, this website that posts a lot of uh, provocative stuff. And this was a, oh, yeah. and this was a piece uh, called The Never-Ending War on Cancer. It's by a guy named... Uh, Cass Thomas, who likes to 
use statistics to try to uh, debunk some common scientific and medical beliefs. And uh, you've probably seen this, this uh, graph before. I remember seeing something very similar to it when I was working on a special issue on cancer for Scientific American um, in, I think it was 1997. It was right before mm -hmm. I, uh, I left there. Um, it's, it basically shows cancer mortali mortality rates corrected for the aging of the population and that they are virtually flat for as long as they have been measured. So this particular right. chart starts in 1960. The one that I saw uh, went back to uh, 1950, as, a re as I recall. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, you know, there is a very slight increase starting in the early 1970s, ironically, when you had the uh, creation of the National Cancer Institute, Nixon declared a war on cancer. He started having really serious money going into research on cancer, um, yeah. including uh, treatments, and rates actually went up slightly after that. They have been dropping slightly since um, the early 1990s. And yeah. uh, it's, you know, so what I find fascinating about this is that it seems to be almost like a complement of what you're saying, except applied to medical treatment. And it's, it's depressing and disturbing because it suggests yeah. that all that the effort that we're putting into this, we have spent more than or almost $500 billion on yeah. cancer research in this country since yeah. over the last uh, 40 years since the war yeah. on cancer was declared, and it's really made no difference. No, and, not, not so good. I mean, it's made, you know, difference in individual cases, and there's people alive that wouldn't be alive. But it's not a huge, significant dent at all. And um, what, what has come out of all that research, which is great, is like a much deeper understanding of cellular science. Right. Because, you know, you really have to understand how a cell works when things are going right to understand what happens when one uh, starts, the, you know, becoming cancerous and evolving into to a tumor in your body. But, um, yeah, as far as the, the dead on mortality, um, you know, very, very small, very small effect. And so we're not getting much better in general at treating cancer. We're getting better at detecting it. And so you have to adjust for that when you, you know, think it looks like there's more cancer. But even, you know, like if you look at the, uh, the National Cancer Institute through their, uh, their SEER, S-E-E-R, their statistical um, branch that collects all of these numbers, they, they collect numbers for both incidence and for mortality. Right. How many people get cancer in the first place and how many people, people die from it. And again, you can look and see, it's kind of that same thing where around, you know, there's a period where, you know, just the cancer a few decades ago, it kind of starts going up a little and then it kind of levels off and then it's been going down ever since. And it's very hard to tease out, you know, whether that increase was real or whether it was because of much better diagnostics. So that's one thing we have become much, much better at is diagnosing cancer before, you know, much earlier before it has, has um, deadly effects. But on the other hand, the, you know, the flip side of that is that, you know, cancers are being finded and treated that probably would not have developed uh, into anything, you know, life-threatening or even health-affecting, you know, before, you know, the person died at age 70 or 80 from something else. Yeah, you know my feelings about that, that I yeah. think, in fact, it's not just that I think, it's I, I, I've seen analyses that, that demonstrate that um, our obsession with uh, testing for screening for cancer uh, has played a huge role in our sky-high medical costs, and it helps to explain, yeah. and, and that some of these tests, it's been shown with, with uh, mammograms and, and tests for uh, uh, prostate cancer, for example, that, the, yeah, that, particularly that you know, there's not a net benefit that, in fact, that uh, more people are harmed by getting tests that are uncovering um, cancer that wouldn't have been malignant or that wouldn't, wasn't life-threatening or that wasn't cancer yeah. at all, and then getting treatments that actually are, are, um, are harmful, not to mention all the psychological issues that you get by 
yeah. by having a diagnosis of, of uh, cancer. But I, it, it's, I don't know. To me, it's, it is, and in the meantime, according to this chart, you've had rates of, um, of heart disease mortality really going down. And in fact, yeah, right. heart, heart disease is about to, it's on course to dip under cancer as the number one killer of right. uh, Americans. Meanwhile, uh, d death from stroke, cerebrovascular diseases is, has gone mm -hmm. uh, way down. Of course, death yeah. from, um, from accidents have gone down as we've gotten better about uh, yeah. regulating automobiles and uh, the workplace and and so forth. So, um, you know, you've got this, I don't know if you can call it an anomaly, because I think um, you have a similar case with, uh, with mental illness, with psychiatry, I, I see also is just not really making any progress in, in uh, treating severe mental illness. Um, yeah. But what's striking about cancer is that you've had all these Nobel Prizes awarded for breakthroughs in the understanding of the genetics of cancer um, at mm -hmm. the cellular level and even below that. Uh, yeah. And yet, you, and there's always been the assumption, and it's so reasonable, that that will be translated into uh, practical applications, into better treatments, and it just yeah. hasn't happened. Well, yeah, and that, that's a constant, there's a constant controversy, you know, within the field and people talking about translational medicine and, the, and this big effort in the last, uh, oh, I don't know how many years, but this big effort to uh, try to get the results from the clinic, I mean, from the laboratory to the clinic that much faster. And so far that hasn't really, really been happening, I don't think, in any measurable, measurable way, but... Uh, you know, it's a real dilemma, and you get people demonstrating, you know, especially you know, people with cancer who are obviously very upset about the fact that you know, there's nothing that can be done for their stage 4 cancer except this very debilitating chemotherapy that might add several months to their life at the cost of tens of thousands of dollars. And um, you're just saying, you know, why are all these breakthroughs, or why is all this money being spent on, on basic research to learn about cancer instead of how it, learning how to treat cancer, which I think is, you know, very short-sighted. Right. But, under, you know, I can understand, obviously, why you know, someone would, would just be angry about this if it were affecting them personally or a loved, per, loved one, and, and yet... But then you've also got the... You have to have the basic research, and it's, it, and it's not the... I mean, cancer is an incredibly difficult problem. It makes heart disease seem, seem so much easier in comparison, makes any infectious disease. It's not something, cancer is not something that happens to you from the outside, although that can be a factor, but it's something just woven into our very, you know, just the very nature of metazoan creatures. Metazoan meaning multicellular creatures, and it's just, you know, woven hand in hand with the evolution of life. Yeah, I, I see it as in some ways analogous to schizophrenia and bipolar and mm. you know, all these diseases we have, these mental disorders, we have labels for them, but even something like schizophrenia, many people think might actually just be this sort of catch-all category for all these different disorders with, with uh, different um, patterns of causation. Definitely there, there have to be genetic factors. The family, uh, the, the, the inheritance patterns suggest that very strongly, but then it's, but it's definitely not uh, solely genetics, that there, there have to be all these environmental, other environmental factors, but who knows what, what, yeah. um, what the hell they are. George, I wanted to get, it's a little bit late now in terms of the news cycle, but I'm really curious yeah. to get your thoughts on, on the whole, um, uh, on what Angelina Jolie did, her announcement, very dramatic, that uh, she had the BRCA mutant mm. gene, um, that gave her a very high risk of uh, breast and cervical cancer, I think, and uh, decided decided to have a, uh, a double mastectomy, as we're calling. I think she just also had, uh, I don't know if it was a hysterectomy or her, her cervix. Oh, an ophorectomy was when they re removed your ovaries. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just curious about your take on, 
on what yeah. she did and whether or not that was a good model of how to react to this new genetic information about the risk of yeah, cancer. I mean, it's, well, I, it's an unusual case, like people who have that BRCA gene mutation. I mean, that is one of the few cases where there's a genetic basis to a cancer that's just so strong and so powerfully overwhelming that, uh, you know, within that context, with her family history, and, you know, given the alternatives as far as, you know, lack of any real effective treatment, it, it was a rational decision. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wrote a blog, blog post about that, but um, it doesn't affect many women because there's only, you know, there's only a, a percentage of breast cancer that's related to this this inherited mutation, and uh, you know, most breast cancer, we have no, they have no idea what causes the, the genetic mutations, to what degree it's environmental in the way that most people think of environmental, you know, meaning poisons in the atmosphere, or environmental in the sense of, of diet, or uh, environmental in the sense of, of uh, choosing to not have children or to have fewer children or to have children later in life which has effects on your estrogen balance and estrogen is actually a very powerful carcinogen among all the wonderful things it also does so um, I mean you know it, it, it's it's a decision that would only face a, a, uh, a percentage of the population that knew they had this this mutation but it's just a horrible position to be in. Yeah, I are there any are there good data on survival rates of, of women who have had these kind of preemptive mastectomies or uh, or removal of their ovaries, these sorts of things to because they, they have one of these tests and or maybe let's say they just have a a uh, this an inheritance pattern in their family and they decide to do this. Yeah. Um, is are there good data suggesting that that really will protect you? Well, well it's a hundred percent effective as far as Oh it is. Okay, so it's not like they breast get, cancer or, but it, but uh but I mean they could get some other kind of cancer or I guess that's Well yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean to the extent that there that, that may be others related. I mean a lot of cancers are estrogen related to one degree or another in that estrogen one of the things that it does is um, it stimulates cells to divide at a faster rate. Right. So you know, you know, so during the, the, the monthly dose of estrogen in the menstrual cycle, it's causing uh, a much more rapid development of uh, mammary cells in the breasts and of uh, cells in the uterus, you know, to prepare for the possibility of a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and one of the, one of the changes in modern civilization is that uh, women don't have to be pregnant, you know, whenever their, their, whenever their womb is available and then they can make these these decisions and you can have family planning and things but the result of this is you know the body that basically evolved to have babies as often as it possibly could and then spread as many genes as it possibly could is uh, going to have to deal with these extra influxes of estrogen and if estrogen is causing cells to rapidly divide with each division there's a greater I mean there's a tiny chance of getting a mutation right. and of those mutations a certain number of them will be the uh, mutations that contribute to a tumor, uh, to a, a cancer cell dividing out of hand and evolving into a tumor. Mm -hmm. So, um, so in that, I mean, you know, there's preventive, uh, you know, people get preventive uh, oorectomies where their uh, ovaries are uh, removed to keep estrogen from uh, feeding the possibility of a breast cancer later. I'm not aware of any direct link that's been found between between estrogen and other cancers but they're, they're surely there but right. I mean how would you yeah but how would you measure that with you know, a woman getting a preventive mastectomy because I mean it's like getting you know if you, you get your prostate removed because you um, you know, got you know so you came out really bad on your PSA test you'll never know if you would have gotten gotten a, uh, a deadly variety of prostate cancer that would have metastasized to your bones right. and led to a horrible painful death or if you would have been one of the majority of old men who you know die with some kind of form of smoldering prostate cancer that never you know really becomes apparent well, my mother um, was diagnosed with uh, 
breast cancer in the late 1970s and she got a uh, mastectomy and um, and then uh, was diagnosed with brain tumor uh, a brain tumor I think maybe oh, four well, yeah. years later and that killed her yeah oh god uh, that's terrible so um, but yeah I mean in that case you don't yeah I mean someone who already has right cancer and then gets a mastectomy of course that's very different right. because you know once you have a cancer if it's reached the lymphatic system of the blood system you can get these micro metastases that can smolder for years and years and years yeah and yet yeah mm. um well anyway as i said i think uh you know your your book has the potential really to uh to focus attention on on some of these uh, larger issues related to cancer that are, are really interesting in, in treatment and uh, the role of industrial pollutants and all that. Well, thanks. I hope so. It was a hard, hard book to write, but emotionally as well as uh, intellectually, just because of the own, you know, the experiences that I've you know, not had directly myself, but among you know people I cared very much about. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like cancer is like mental illness in that no matter how little progress we make, we can't ever give up. You know, we just have yeah. to keep yeah. going. Right. I don't know. I, right. I, you know, at some point maybe you can say, do we need, should we be spending billions on this? Uh, I, but it's kind of a weird argument to say that um, we should spend less because we haven't been making progress. I mean. No, yeah, exactly. I, I mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of these things where if they're looking for ways to save on federal spending, that's not the place to look. Yeah. You know, take it out of any number of other other areas and put it into scientific research. Although I, I did use that kind of argument in arguing that the um, you know there's this new uh, brain initiative that Obama has announced. I forget if we, oh, we talked right. about this the last time we met. It's been yeah. a while. And uh, it's going to be a hundred billion, a hundred million dollars a year, and it's this attempt to create this kind of great map of um, of the brain. Yeah. And uh, there are all these very high level people who have been involved in uh, planning it. There's a European counterpart to this that's also that's I think even better funded by the European Union. And um, and I wrote a couple of nasty negative posts about it that basically saying mm -hmm. that um, this would be like having the genome project before we even knew what genes did. Yeah, um, yeah. And, uh, but I, I see the counter argument that we're, we're putting this money into it and organizing this thing uh, because neuroscience has been so um, disappointing so far. Yeah. And this might be a way of focusing efforts that the counter argument to that is that um, if you're premature in committing resources to something like this, you know, it's, 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 um, it's not like all this money is coming, it's all being generated anew. It's, you, you have to take money away from some other things. And so maybe right. you're taking it away from some of these blue sky things, a little tiny projects yeah. that could actually find uh, something extremely important that, that the, yeah. the mainstream people at the top don't take seriously. So, yeah, there, there's definitely a there's definitely a danger in just becoming too homogeneous and just having all of the money directed toward one grand big project, you know, and setting all these these goals as opposed to you know kind of the standard method where you, you know, let a let a million blossoms flower. What, what was Mao's <laughs> hundred flowers bloom or something like that? Not that this has anything to do with Maoism, but. <laughs> But um, yeah, you know, it's uh, you know, there's a, and there's a lot of criticism against just setting these these goals, which are probably unrealistic ones. And it's the big science. And, it's the whole. It's the old debate about big science. The whole big science thing, yeah. And the Human Genome Project. I mean, that was something science was obviously ready for, and it and it's um, you know resulted in you know just all of this you know you know wonderful trove of extra knowledge. But I think as you pointed out and in some of your your columns or, or posts, it's uh, hasn't really translated into uh, you know medical improvement of medical care. No, it's it's. But it, that shouldn't be the measure. It's it should be hoped for and, and striven for. But 
It shouldn't be the measure, but it is definitely what the politicians talk about when they have well, the ribbon yeah. cutting ceremonies and announce that they're right. funneling hundreds of millions of dollars into these things. They talk about diseases because that's what right. people care about. People don't care yeah. about the illumination no. of, of inheritance and all that jazz. Yeah. They want to know how is this going to benefit me and how and you know with with good yeah. reason if it's their uh, their um, taxpayer dollars. Another thing that specifically bothers me about the direction of neuroscience in this country, and it's exemplified by the big new uh, brain initiative, is that the Pentagon now is the major funder. So oh, right, most of right. the money for, I think, $60 million um, of this new $100 million uh, program, $100 million for the first year uh, for neuroscience, is being put up by DARPA, this uh, yeah, Pentagon right. Research Agency. And, you know, DARPA has a pretty good reputation and uh, with good reason for being a supporter of basic research. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's I mean, not the mean. NSF. It's, it no. is a military <laughs> organization. And yeah. um, I know from my own research that they definitely have interests in boosting the capacity of soldiers on the battlefield. Oh, um, yeah, enhanced. Right. Yeah. And that worries me. I mean, it's... Well, yeah, and yeah, yeah. You, you've written some really good things about that. Well, thank you. It's, I, you know, I feel like a crank sometimes. I was just having uh, lunch with some other Scientific American editors, and I was ranting about DARPA's support for the, uh, the neuroscience initiative, and they're all like, what's your problem? DARPA's really cool, you know, DARPA... They, uh, they're just put, putting up the money. The neuroscientists aren't going to be trying to create bionic soldiers or any of that bullshit. But well, yeah, that's the, you know, that, that, that's the argument, you know, that all the scientists made for years and years and years. You know, they would say the DARPA is very enlightened in the sense that it looks at defense as being the best way to defend our country is to have the best science and to support really, really basic research because who knows what will come out of that. But yeah, I was recently discussing that with a scientist friend who, um, who really believed that wasn't the case so much anymore. The DARPA really under the current, uh, you know, current management, and I, I know nothing about the details, has really moved much more to looking for these kind of practical, more immediate applications that, uh, that you've written about, like the enhanced soldier with, uh, you know, the souped up brain and senses that uh, is more effective in the battlefield or, or robot soldiers and uh... I have heard that as well it's interesting you picked that up I just saw a, uh, a discussion on the web somewhere that DARPA has shifted away from research and toward development and applications in the same way that the hmm. great industrial labs did I mean you know Bell Labs used to have people doing astrophysics and um, the most basic, useless, impractical kind of research uh, just because that was part of its greatness. It was this kind of prestige yeah. status thing. IBM used to have this wonderful lab down at Yorktown, right down, uh, oh, yeah. right down the road from me, where they had, right. again, they were, they were very proud of supporting basic research. And I'm sure you can still find people doing what you could call basic research um, at some of these great industrial labs, but much less than in the glory yeah. days in the 60s, 70s, and... Uh, oh, yeah, and even Bell Labs, for example. Yeah, right. Shadows yeah. Of, the former, of their former selves. And, and with DARPA, it's not surprising that, that uh, you know, that even Congress would say, look, it's a military agency. You guys should be supporting stuff that's going to help the yeah. military in the future. Yeah, what's with this basic research? And yeah, hey, this sounds like a blog post for you. <laughs> and I mean, you know, specifically about the change at DARPA. Yeah, yeah, maybe I could get somebody there uh, to to talk about that. Um, yeah. It's just that I, in the past, I know scientists who take money from DARPA are really defensive about it and do not like to admit yeah. to even having any struggles in their conscience about taking right. money from the military and insist that there's no compromise on their part. Uh, yeah. And uh, so anyway, um, all right, we've got five yeah. minutes left. Oh, <clears throat> okay. Hey, listen, do you want to talk about your 
the, the this tragedy involving the lightning chaser, this guy. Oh, that's right. We haven't talked since that happened, did we? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. As most most of our our listeners probably know. Uh, uh, Tim Samaras, the storm chaser, and who I knew as, as someone I went out chasing lightning storms with, specifically for this article I did that was published last year in National Ge Geographic, died just horribly in a car with his, his son with him who was on the storm chase, and his, uh, his friend and colleague Carl Young, and out, out in you know, those horrible uh, tornadoes earlier this summer in um, Oklahoma mm -hmm. and no I mean, it's just unbelievably shocking you know just I, I mean as recently as a year ago I'd been dealing you know I've been in constant or regular communication with Tim Samaras about this article I was writing and asking follow-up questions and I followed around with him you know riding shotgun in his truck while we chased uh, thunderstorms across the panhandles and mm -hmm. All three of these people I, I, I had met uh, in one time or another during my research, and all you know, just the most you know, high quality, you know, just wonderful, humane, and very careful, careful, right. serious people. And, these were not cowboys. And not cowboys, and, and and it's just horrible to think, you know, we really don't really. I mean, we don't know what happened in, in, in any detail except you know this this crushed. Tin can of a car found with the with the three three dead men in it. Yeah, that's that's um, that was really sad. I, I was uh, yeah. I, it was heartbreaking to read your your tribute to them. Um. Uh. So uh, maybe I'll just mention one thing that I wrote that's kind yeah. of getting some attention. It's the last post I wrote. Um, so I saw online. Uh, I guess it was a New York Times story mentioning that there's this gigantic report on the humanities, why people should right. bother studying the humanities. As everybody must know, enrollment in the humanities uh, has been plunging for a while now. And um, you know, students just don't see the point. Parents, I don't think, see the point. Universities mm -hmm. are putting fewer and fewer resources into a traditional liberal arts education, philosophy, and history, and, and um, uh, literature, and, and uh, the social sciences, psychology, what I would call the soft sciences. And um, mm -hmm. I, you know, so I, I read a little bit of this big report, and the report was put together by all these big shots from universities. I think and there were some media people. David Brooks contributed to it. I think George Lucas, the Star Wars guy. Um, huh. You know, people from all over the place, yeah. a bunch of scientists, and, uh, you know, they, they had this thing, this sort of defense of the humanities, but it was it sounded very kind of instrumental, if you know what I mean. I mean, still it was mm -hmm. about how humanities can be, can help make people good citizens and good employees right. and all this kind of shit, which I actually hate. Um, and <laughs> It's a very weak, weak defense of... of uh of the vast swaths of human knowledge. Yeah, well, and culture. So I, you know, I teach humanities at this engineering school, and especially right. I teach this survey course, humanities survey course, to freshmen every year now, um, which is like you know, Plato, Marx, Shakespeare. I mean, it's it's all that kind of stuff, you know, the canon, yeah. and. Uh, and I know that a lot of these students, because I asked them, in fact, most of them, in some cases, every single one in the class, would prefer not to take this class, but it's, it's required. And so I say, yeah. you know, what is it? What, why don't you want to take this class? Because it has nothing to do with our careers and so forth. We came here to learn to be engineers. Yeah. I'd, rather, I'd rather have another course in statistical mechanics and, than read fucking Sophocles. And um, I, t I totally get that. <laughs> so my spiel is that um, you are, you know, in your other classes, engineering and science and mathematics and so forth, you're really getting answers. And, and in fact, the way a lot of these classes are taught, it's one way, you know. It's yeah. the teachers are saying, this is stuff you have to know, all right, for mm -hmm. your major or uh, 
whatever. Here's the knowledge we have about chemistry, physics, uh, calculus, and uh, so forth. And yeah. what I in the and what I tell my students is that in this humanities class, I'm going to basically make you doubt everything that you hmm. believe and everything that you're told. And it's not in a postmodern way because I think a lot of scientific knowledge is uh, is absolute and actually yeah. is telling us real things about the world. But um, that it, it is crucial, especially when it comes to science, that's helping us understand ourselves as humans and, and try to figure out what we should do in the world and what it means to be a good person or a bad person and, yeah. and how we should be uh, as a uh, society. It's really important to question our beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what the humanities have done for me, and that's what I want them uh, to do for you. And so I... I wrote this up in this blog post, and um, it's really good, by the well, way. Thank it was you. very. It, it, I, I found it really inspiring. Well, it's for me, and, and I loved how you described. <laughs> I loved how your your comment about Socrates. Yes, Socrates is a pompous windbag, but <laughs> he actually had some pretty cool things to say. Um, and uh, and this thing kind of went for me. It kind of went viral, meaning I had a few thousand likes. And I think it's, wow. I feel almost bad because to me it indicates how desperate people are in the humanities for any kind of justification of what they do. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm glad that some no, people really responded to it. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it was great. And, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of this, I think, too, is a byproduct of just how incredibly expensive the college education has become. Yeah. And um, there, there just wasn't that pressure when I was in college, mm -hmm. you know, to, to even declare a major before the second or third year. You know, the whole idea was you were, you were looking around and getting this wide liberal education, and then you were going to focus in on something specific and go with it, or not, <laughs> in which case you become a journalist. And... and um, you basically are just curious about all kinds of things and and uh, teach yourself how to write about them. But mm -hmm. yeah, this pri it's completely changed. I mean, when I, I remember my uh, so my ex brother in law is that what you would call the brother of your ex wife? That sounds right. <laughs> I remember his daughter was starting college, and for some reason we were all in the same place talking about this, and, and she wasn't sure what she wanted to to uh, major in, and, and I was saying the kind of advice that I had always heard when I was her age, oh, you don't need to worry about that now, you know, the first year or two, you should just be trying lots of things and just seeing what you want to do with your life, and then I could see ex-brother-in-law kind of, you know, going, no, 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 and I'm just kind of signaling me, like, you know, don't put this stuff in her head, and I thought, ah, oh, that's sad, and then again, you know, he was paying, I don't know, how many tens of thousands of dollars uh, a year for her to go to the school, and I get it. Listen, it's become trade school. College is becoming this really advanced trade school. And right, it's not good. And sometimes even the humanities are just uh, are are part of the. Are, it's it's almost as though the humanities are being recast to make them compatible with a uh, trade school and. That's really? what I don't like. I think the humanities should be subversive and anti-authoritarian. And uh, although maybe you could sit, say that's because that's my idea of a good citizen is somebody who's challenging the status quo. And and by the way, yeah. obviously that's also my idea of journalism, which is uh, that it should be questioning the status quo in the same way that you uh, and this article um, on cancer are challenging mm -hmm. some very popular beliefs about um, modern civilization and its relationship to disease uh, yeah. in a way that's really important. So, um, and you know, science should do that, but yeah. often that kind of philosophy of science is just, you know, if you, you're just trying to teach, um, you, you're just trying to teach uh, mechanics to a bunch of students who are going to become mechanical engineers or, or whatever, you don't have fucking time yeah. for Thomas Kuhn and Karl Popper and philosophy of science. No, yeah, you've got to start. I mean, there's just a huge amount of information right. you have to funnel into all of these these brains, and 
And that was an interesting thing about your post, is you had a postscript um, uh, based on some objections that one of your colleagues at Stevens had said, and that if science is taught right, yeah. you know, you are skeptical, and you realize that you know any hypothesis, can, even the most solid ones, can can in theory be overturned by a new experiment or a new observation or set of observations. And and you know, I thought your response to that was was really good. I mean, yes, ideally, and when you you know scientists who, who become scientists and get up to that level know that and learn that along the way, but um, it's not taught that way. It's really taught almost as received wisdom in the early years. At least that was my experience. Right. Yeah. Mine as well. And listen, that, that we are, I, I think this particular era in the 30 years that I've been professionally watching science, I've never seen science more uh, full of itself than it is right now. And ironically, I don't think science has a lot to brag about right now. Um, hmm. So, anyway, okay, I just wanted to say that, and uh, I, you know, we're we're uh, an hour and six minutes in now, so. Yeah, I guess that's that's, that's enough for anyone. <laughs> right. All right, man. Um, good talking to you as always. Uh, we should talk again, right, when your your book comes out. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, that'll be, God, it won't, won't be too, yeah, maybe once more before okay. that. Try to, try to stick to our rough uh, rough monthly schedule, which I know we've we've let slide, and the last couple times it was my fault. Well, you know where to find me. Whenever you want to talk, just let me know. Hey, that sounds good, John. Okay, talk soon, George. Okay, I'll be, I'll be watching, your, watching your call. All right, thanks. Me too. <laughs> okay. Bye.